Good morning, Glavin Free Methodist Church. God is good. And all the time. We're so glad you're here today. Um, you know, we, um, I've been following this week in some things that are happening in Asbury. And um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Sundays I've gathered in, with you and I've talked about a need for revival. And this past year, there have been things happening in different parts of the world. And one of the things that happens during revival is sometimes people miss that revival is happening, but revival is happening in our nation. And there have been different things that have been coming up that uh, are not planned where God is moving. And over this last, well, Wednesday at Asbury University in Kentucky, uh, they had chapel service, and they're still having chapel service, friends. God's moving. And, uh, and the world doesn't understand. News media showed up, and they're trying to report on it. They don't understand, but God's moving. And this weekend, um, there's a whole list of at least 20 different other uh, colleges and universities are heading there with students because they weren't, they're hungry for what God's doing. And uh, we're hearing reports of other things happening at other universities. God's working. How often have we prayed for young people to be stirred by the move of God? And uh, he's moving. So I want to ask you um, to uh, sometime today, not while Steve's preaching, but look at the news outlets, Google Asbury Revival, and see what's happening there. And, uh, and, pray, and pray for that, and pray for God to be moving in our hearts. Because um, God, God wants his truth, his love to be known and revealed. And I uh, want us to be mindful that we have, we have a, a day planned of worshiping and celebrating God's call for some to go on a short-term mission project, mission trip to Detroit coming up in March. We're going to share a meal together because it's Super Bowl Sunday, so we're going to have soups after service. And if you forgot or didn't bring anything to eat, there's a lot of food. There's a lot of soup brewing all over the building. So stay, come to Sunday school and stay and eat and enjoy a good time here about the, the trip coming up and, and how you can be part of that and be involved. And, um, but just plan to be here. Um, so I think Dave has a scripture for us, right? All right. Testing, testing. Okay. Make sure you're out there. Anyway, uh, Pastor Steve wanted me uh, just to share some words from uh, our call to worship. You want me to do that first? Okay. Okay. From uh, Romans chapter 3, very powerful words, starting with verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. And we just did a song called Redeemed, written by Mike Weaver and um, some other guy. Uh, but anyway, I kind of was interested in what the, uh, how he come to write this song. And this is by the group Big Daddy Weave. Um, and Mike Weaver is quite a big guy, and so it kind of stems from him writing this song about growing up with many self-esteem issues because he was a big guy. And I've come to realize that no matter what kind of persona the world looks at you with, there's a lot of people that you would think have it all together. Um, you know, everything is going great for them, but inside they're very broken. We're a bunch of broken people. And uh, I, can, I can connect with this song just for the fact of growing up and even living all my life of always comparison. And uh, we do that with, you know, we're never enough, we're never measure up. And, and that's what he kind of wrote this song about. But we are redeemed, and as Christ followers, we have to walk in the truth of who we are. We might have made a lot of mistakes, might have a lot of shame, grief in our past. But as Christ followers, we are redeemed by the blood of Christ because he died and rose again that uh, we can walk in newness of life. And uh, he says at one point here, I'm not the man I used to be. And uh, my favorite verse is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, all things become new. And I'm telling you what, I'm not the person I used to be. I'm not the person I'm going to be. Uh, but through Christ, uh, I press on and press forward, and I praise God for that.
Uh, I have a note here, and I know who left it, and I think it's hilarious. It says, announcement for the pastor to make, the con- make to the congregation. You should be as excited about church as about the Super Bowl. So when your pastor makes a point today, pour Gatorade over his head. <laughs> I'm scanning the room to see if there's any Gatorade. That's what you're preaching. Oh, is that it? <laughs> Boy, well, nonetheless, I am excited to, uh, to preach today, bring the word today. Uh, we are continuing our journey of looking at the realities of grace and truth, understanding that uh, that Jesus was and is the fullness of grace and truth, uh, something that we humans struggle with. We tend to either be very full of grace or very full of truth and, and seldom the fullness of both. Uh, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1 today. Um, so if you want to turn there, but uh, as we've been looking at that, we've looked at the reality that uh, the, the world and all that's in it was created uh, by our magnificent God and Savior and uh, with a special love towards humanity and for humanity. And that humankind was given responsibility to be, uh, to be stewards of this earth and stewards in a real sense of one another uh, and want to and desire to bring one another Uh, into this loving relationship with God. And, uh, you know, Pastor Phil uh, shared with us last week about the reality of sin, something that we all deal with and experience, but uh, at different times run and hide from the reality of our own sin in different ways. Uh, And thankfully, because because of the reality of sin, God has given us a means of Uh, reconciliation or redemption, that song, uh, amazing song, redeemed, that big word, redeemed, uh, that gives us a new identity. Jesus paid the price that you and I may be made new and uh, a new person uh, with this uh, amazing value and Uh, the very fingerprint of God, not just on our physical aspects, but our spiritual aspects as we walk in that newness of life. Uh, So sharing from Colossians chapter 1, I don't remember what verse I started with, verse 9 it looks like. Uh, And so I'm going to share from there and just read through uh, 23. Uh, And it reads this, And so, from the day we heard, uh, and this is uh, Paul and um, and that talking about or hearing uh, about this church in Colossus that they have heard of what's going on there. And from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy, and blameless, and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, 
stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And boy, I got to tell you, if you are ever at a spiritual low point and you need just a, a, a quick jolt from God's word, you jump to Colossians chapter 1 and that should get you fired up reading about how amazing Jesus is and what he has done and continues to do for us. <clears throat> and in fact, I, as I was thinking about this, uh, and I want to do this uh, right now this morning, those first few verses are just really an amazing prayer to pray through. So I'd like to, I'd like to pray for us through, uh, through essentially verses 9 uh, through 14. So would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that we may be filled with the knowledge of your will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that we may walk in a manner worthy of you, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in our knowledge of God the Father. So that we may be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. We give thanks to you, Father, for you have qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom. Uh, and through that kingdom, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, as we hear and engage with your word this morning, Father, would you make these words true within the life of each person here today, each person who connects with this service uh, online or by radio or whatever means later on. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we see Paul is, is writing this, this incredible text reminding us that, uh, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Uh, for the people who are going through the Sunday evening study uh, in the book of Hebrews, which, by the way, we are not meeting tonight. Uh, for people who are going through that Sunday evening study in the book of Hebrews, we learn uh, right in, it's either uh, the second or third verse of Hebrews, uh, what we learn is that Jesus is the uh, very divine and direct image of God. He's not a replica He's not an accidental image of God, but he is the very direct and divine image of God. And Paul's repeating that here. The image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. And through him and by him, all things were created. He, Jesus, is before all things and holds all things together. He is the very head of the body, the church, having nothing to do with the building, but rather a collective of individuals united around a common purpose. And in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So in him, the fullness of God came to earth, interacted with humanity in a very direct fashion, interceded for the sake of humanity as well, to, as it says, reconcile himself all to all things, whether on heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood of the cross. We need to understand and think about the reality of, of sin and our own sinfulness when we uh, when we read or see or hear expressions of making peace or reconciling us to himself by the blood of the cross. Because there is not one, there is not one who is without sin, who has not, who has not lived in bondage of sinfulness. There are plenty of good people but even in the midst of good people being good by the world's standards, there is sinfulness. And Jesus came to make peace and to reconcile, our, uh, reconcile human, humankind, humanity, 
uh, to himself, to God, by paying the ultimate price for that sin. So that we can be presented holy and blameless and above reproach. So that we can be made pure, cleansed, and made holy so that so that we can be presented before God the Father. The way that we were intended, without sin, yes, the sin will still affect us. The effects of sin will still be there. But Jesus has paid the price and made the way. And there is a big if here. If you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. I want to talk, talk a while about that word or that idea of, of gospel. Uh, Michelle and I have had, or we do have, or in the midst of it, uh, opportunity to take part in uh, a 10-month-long uh, training class, seminar, however you want to call it, uh, through the conference led by uh, Superintendent Jeff Ford. Uh, and it's uh, through the Bonhoeffer Project, bears the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who was a minister of the gospel in the time of World War II, who paid the price uh, of his life for the sake of his faith uh, during that time. Uh, but one who, uh, who took and taught and lived and, and held and shared a very comprehensive view of the gospel. And at the beginning of that class, that session that we started, one of our very first assignments was to ask, I forget how many people, a handful of people anyway, what is the gospel? What does the gospel mean? And it was surprising at the way that people inside of church, outside of church, uh, stumbled and staggered with what is the gospel. And the reality is, as time has passed since Jesus walking on this very earth and living in front of us in the early days of the church, the reality is the functional meaning, the way we live and teach and multiply the gospel has, has changed uh, has morphed, as things are prone to do, uh, across the span of time and across people, uh, much like the telephone game that we, many of us probably played when we were, uh, oh, maybe about kindergarten age, where one person says, whispers something in the ear of the next, and so on and so on and so on. And if I start it and whisper it into Alex's ear and pass it down to the back, by the time it gets to Mark or even uh, further yet, Teresa in the very back, and they share what I said, it's going to be way different. Kind of the same idea with the gospel across the span of time and individuals. And uh, Bill Hall, one of the co-founders of the Gospel Project, I'm going to take you through this. It's a, if you're a note taker, it's a great time to take some notes. Uh, really categorizes these for us into six different gospels. The first, of those, <clears throat> the first of those gospels that we see uh, is the forgiveness-only gospel. I want to make sure that's coming up for you. So we had some questions about whether or not it was going to work for us. All right. Take a brief pause for station identification. There we go. All right. Cool. Uh, so the forgiveness only gospel, uh, in summary, is the notion or the gospel that uh, is preached or taught or shared or believed uh, that the gospel of Jesus Christ centers around, uh, I ask for forgiveness and I receive forgiveness uh, and then I'm good. I'm set to go, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, uh, and I'm going to be in heaven someday. 
uh, what that forgiveness only gospel leads to uh, is a mindset. And when we have that mindset as individuals or a church, that's what we multiply and share, is that following Christ is optional. In other words, I've said a prayer, but my life doesn't look any different. I can, uh, I can, I can pray for forgiveness. God, I believe, please forgive me of my sins, and I'm not a new man. I keep on living the same way I was. Following Christ is optional. Uh, that should be, but the way it was set up, I couldn't change it. Sanctified passivity, meaning uh, uh, my holiness comes along automatically without any real change on my part at all. And what this, this forgiveness-only gospel, what it looks like in terms of uh, worship often, uh, corporate worship is the, the preacher will say a prayer, uh, and there'll be an altar call, and people will maybe will come up and, uh, and say what we often refer to as the sinner's prayer, and walk away, and nothing ever changes for them beyond that moment, other than perhaps they come to church more frequently for a while anyway. And so as we go through these, I would encourage you to think about, maybe make notes by, or continue to think about if you need to think a lot longer, which gospel are you living according to in your own life? Which gospel are you sharing? Which gospel do others see in your life? So we have the forgiveness-only gospel, and I'm sure uh, you know people who live in the reality of that gospel. We have the prosperity gospel. We're going to claim our rights in the name of Jesus. What the prosperity gospel creates is a sense of entitlement or, uh, or the sense that we're, we're managing God or some might even say manipulating God. It's a gospel that has been extremely popular in recent years, uh, really, in a sense, throughout the world. It's a gospel, though, that often leads to uh, a celebration of blessings and the way that, that man, the way that culture tends to measure blessings anyway. I got a raise. I got a promotion. Uh, I was able to buy this nice new or newer vehicle. And those are, those are great things, don't get me wrong. But that's not the primary manifestation or expression of God in the lives of his followers. So it celebrates blessings, but when bad times come, often uh, in or under the prosperity gospel, uh, that tends to indicate their belief that... Uh, uh, for some reason, you are outside of God's will. Kind of like Job, you know, when, when all this uh, affliction settled upon Job, and he was going through this unbelievable tough time, the loss of his family, his wealth, his health, that his friends, his wife said, surely you must have sinned. But that's not the true gospel. That doesn't lead us into uh, the continuance of faith, stable and steadfast, as Paul wrote in Colossians. We have the left gospel as well. Uh, and the left gospel is one that, again, not all bad for sure, help the needy. There are so many people in need, and so my expression uh, or my representation of Jesus in this earth is I'm going to help the needy. And out of that kind heart and out of that service to others often develops this uncomfortable position where uh, the truth becomes negotiable. We don't want to call sin, sin anymore because that might, in our eyes, harm or hurt those in need. True truth is optional. You can't really know for sure 
I mean, the Bible says some things, but that was written a long time ago, and a lot of people touched it since then. And how that comes about in worship expressions is a culture, a church culture, that God loves everyone, which we know to be true, but he loves you just as you are. There's no call on your life to step out of anything, uh, step out of sinfulness and into righteousness. There's no call to something better from something that is not of God. We run into the uh, consumer culture as well, where the church or God exists to meet your needs. What that results in is a self-indulgent impatience. I often think of... uh, Uh, Anybody ever seen the old Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the original one? Yeah. I think of, you remember Baruka? I want it, and I want it now. And that's something that can manifest in our relationship with God and how we operate and how we communicate within the church. A self-indulgent impatience. There's change that I want to see, and I would like to see it now, if not Two months ago. There is an addiction to desire that comes out of that. We are driven by our wants, not surrendered to God and letting Him work and shape our experiences for His best, for our best, and for His glory. That shows up in churches by churches that are very, very heavy in, uh, in programs, and uh, not just that, but heavy in programs where someone has an idea and there's the thought or the expectation that somebody else, and probably the pastor, should make sure that happens. We have next the right gospel not talking about politically right, though if you aren't politically right, you might think that there's some correlation there. Um, And the right gospel is a mindset of being right. It creates a sense of theological swagger as it manifests that uh, in a way that, uh, well, you know, so-and-so, I'm really concerned about them. We should probably pray for them because... Uh, you know, and, and no, I didn't. This is a hypothetical. Okay, let me make this clear. I saw Pastor Phil out to lunch with, with a woman. It wasn't in the church, and it wasn't Donna. He was alone with her. Let me be clear. It didn't happen, okay? It's hypothetical, okay? <laughs> And so we make assumptions, and we start talking about that. And, and, you know, I saw that, and so, Austin, boy, I know I can trust you. And, uh, boy, you're a man of God. We really need to pray for Pastor Phil, because this is what I saw. And uh, you and I know that that's not right. And so, you know, Pastor Phil's caught in some sinfulness. We really need to pray for him. So... Uh, that's an instance of how that arises in the sense that we see wrong everywhere around us except for in the mirror. And we see uh, where sinfulness is everywhere. Not saying that it's not. uh, But that's our focus. That's what we see. And it brings about a detachment. Individually and in the expression of a church congregation, or separated from the very world, the very society that Jesus called us to minister to and share his truth, his gospel with. Instead, uh, there's there's a a sanctimonious, a, a false holiness of patting ourselves or one another on the back of how holy we are. It tramples others which is something that Jesus was very clearly against. I'm right, you aren't, 
Here's why they are wrong. And then finally, the sixth gospel. And this is perhaps kind of rare, uh, hopefully growing, uh, and confidently growing as uh, I've had opportunity to see and hear uh, some of what's going on in Asbury uh, with the sense of revival and uh, certainly other very clear movements of God around the world. Uh, the kingdom gospel is exactly what Jesus taught when he was on this earth. It was follow me. Jesus saw some crusty, trusty fishermen. He said, follow me. He didn't say to them, say a prayer and get back in your boats. He didn't say to them, God wants you to be prosperous, so cast your nets out and it'll be filled with fish. That came later. He didn't say to them, go help the needy and make them feel good about themselves. He didn't say to them, hey, come over here. I know this Jewish thing maybe isn't working out for you. Come over here and we've got some great programs and we've got a great band and you'll really enjoy it. He didn't say to them, listen to what I have to say and you'll always be right. Instead, he said, follow me. And what that creates is an activist, a sense of, of activ activism that sees injustice in the world, that sees uh, that there are the needy who need help, uh, and they need help in many ways, including spiritually. And there are people who need spiritual help that don't have physical needs at all. It also creates followers who are intent on learning to live as Jesus lived. Hungry for the instances and examples that we see uh, in God's Word of how Jesus uh, dealt with people in the bondage of sin in different circumstances. Uh, hungry for and amazed by the miracles that Jesus worked. In awe of how Jesus upset the political power structure uh, in the land and in the church in particular. And desire. Nothing more than to step out of the realities of this world and walk in the truth and the light of Jesus Christ. No matter the cost. In fact, knowing and believing and trusting Jesus when he said, to follow him will cost you your own life. The way we see that kingdom gospel expressed in worship is a God-fearing, God-forward humility in the lives of his followers and in a collective of his followers where that's present in a church. We see a, a, a expression of repentance, not just once, but as often as needed. As we become aware of uh, the dark areas or the sinfulness in our life, or when we have uh, a moment of weakness in the flesh, an evidence of spirit-filled living. One of, the, uh, one of the accounts or testimonies that I, I read uh, just yesterday from, uh, from the movement that's going on in Asbury, and again, Pastor Phil challenged you, I hope you do, go check it out. Uh, but this was from a professor, uh, don't remember his name, uh, doesn't matter, um, who is at, he's a professor at Asbury Seminary. The chapel is at Asbury University, across the road, one from the other. 
And this, this time of worship uh, started on Wednesday, and it was Friday when this professor uh, made it over there. Um, just busyness of work and so on and so forth. And he shared that in his experience, and, and uh, this struck me because it aligns with my experience too growing up, when, when revival uh, would break out somewhere where we'd see that, or, or in my childhood where I'd hear, hear terms of uh, a revival, what it was associated with was, thinking as a little kid, a loud preacher, yelling at people, people getting excited, people flocking to the altar, people getting excited, sometimes running the aisles. And this professor went over and sat down in the back of the chapel. And he said almost instantly, it was just like his mind, everything was shut down, and then he was brought into this peace that he had never experienced before, the sense of peace. And one of the things that he said that was wild about it was that there was nothing wild going on. There are groups of people singing, groups of people praying, groups of people just talking with one another. But God was powerfully and undeniably in the mix. And so under this kingdom gospel, it's expressed as a spirit-filled individual or spirit-filled church, and that doesn't mean somebody who uh, runs the aisles necessarily. It doesn't mean someone who, uh, who does things like speaking in tongues necessarily. But it will always mean, always mean, a sense of, Peace that is indescribable, that transcends this world, that is not possible on this earth. A sense of calm in the midst of the most tremendous circumstances. It means this synchronicity, this walking in step with Jesus in the most beautiful way imaginable. And that is the kingdom gospel. That is the complete, comprehensive gospel as Jesus lived it, as his word intends it and communicates it. That is the gospel. That is what Jesus calls each and every one of us to. To live in that reality. When we talk about redeemed, he is redeeming us from sinfulness and chaos and turmoil and anxiety and worry and strife and bringing us into his very presence, moment by moment, day by day. That's what he is reconciling us to, so that we may walk and be and live in the presence of God day by day. And that's what Jesus calls us and has commanded us to multiply, to share with others. So ask yourselves, what gospel are you living under? What gospel are you living as a part of? Which gospel have you accepted? If it's not the kingdom gospel, man, come on in. It's amazing. What gospel are you sharing? The one that you live under is the one that you are sharing out loud or through the actions in your life with others. The praise team is going to come up and uh, lead us through amazing grace. Um, if anyone wants to, if you feel compelled to pray, I would encourage you to do so uh, right now. Um, I would encourage you, we'll get uncomfortable with this, it's not required, but I would encourage you to come forward to do so. It represents, it symbolizes that God is calling us out of one thing to something new.
God, you are a good God. And Lord, you want to do a work on us. And you want us to listen to you. And you want us to continue to respond to you. Lord, today we have this opportunity as we, uh, as we continue and as we, we pray and then as we, as we look into your word and as we share a meal to really listen to you and to one another and to pray with one another. Lord, today may we continue to be sensitive to the fact that you are leading us. And Lord, you are our redeemer. And Lord, I think about where my life may have been had I not given it to you. And um, Lord, we know that you are the one, you are the only one who can do anything about the condition of our heart. And you are, you are our redeemer. And we thank you and we praise you. Lord, I pray that you continue to move in this place. And we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As you leave.